Muy buenas tardes. Indicarles como primer aviso que la conferencia del profesor Zamagni se va a impartir en inglés. Se lo comento por si necesitan hacer uso del servicio de, de traducción que se encuentra a la entrada del salón. Gracias. Muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Vamos a intentar cumplir con el programa porque tenemos un horario muy apretado. Antes de comenzar, darles unos avisos. En primer lugar, 
me piden que todos aquellos de ustedes que hayan completado la encuesta referente al cálculo de la huella de carbono, por favor, la entreguen en el punto de información que se encuentra a la salida de la sala. Por otro lado, recordarles que a las siete y media, a las siete y media se celebrará una solemne eucaristía de clausura de este Congreso en la Catedral de Ávila. Se existirán algunos autobuses para poder subir a la gente desde la puerta del Palacio, del palacio de Congresos. Por último, decirles que eh, ya les indiqué que las comunicaciones se encuentran recogidas en el pendrive que ustedes tienen en su carpeta, mientras que las ponencias magistrales y las de, los, y las, de las mesas de expertos se van a colgar en la página web del Congreso. The keynotes and the speeches of expert roundtables will be published at the website. Muchas gracias. Vamos entonces a dar paso a la cuarta ponencia, a la cuarta ponencia magistral. Nos acompañan en la mesa la excelentísima señora Begoña La Fuente Nafría, vicerrectora de profesorado y calidad de la Universidad Católica Santa Teresa de Jesús de Ávila. Don, el excelentísimo señor don Clemente López González, vicerrectora, vicerrector perdón, de profesorado de investigación de la Universidad Francisco de Vitoria y nuestro ponente magistral, excelentísimo señor don Estefano Zamagni, catedrático de Ciencias Económicas de la Universidad de Bolonia. El título de, esta, de su ponencia es sobre la relación Studium e Imperium en la posmodernidad, el papel específico de la Universidad Católica. Sin más preámbulos, voy a dar la palabra al doctor López González para que presente a nuestro conferenciante. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias. Hacer una presentación de nuestro ponente que sea breve y que al mismo tiempo dé buena cuenta de todos los méritos que jalona la carrera profesional de nuestro profesor Stefano Zammagni no solo es algo extremadamente complicado, sino también injusto, puesto que inevitablemente muchas van a ser las omisiones en las que vamos a incurrir. Por eso, Ruego por adelantado al profesor Zamañi que me perdone, que sea benévolo con esta presentación, pero creo que estoy seguro que el auditorio agradecerá que estas palabras introductorias no arrebaten ni un solo minuto al tiempo que le, responde, que le corresponde a nuestro ponente. Como ya se ha dicho, el profesor Zamañi es catedrático de Economía Política de la Universidad de Bolonia, y también ejerce como profesor adjunto de Política Internacional de Economía en la Universidad John Hawkins, en Bolonia. En marzo de 1966 obtuvo el Diploma de Economía y Comercio en la Universidad Católica del Sacro Cuore, en Milán. Además, desde 1985 hasta 2007 ha dado un curso sobre Historia de Análisis Económico en la Universidad Bocconi de Milán. Desde el año 2007 es presidente de la Agencia para el Tercer Sector, entre sus actividades académico-administrativas, cabe destacar que desde 1987 hasta 1993 fue director del Departamento de Ciencia Económica y entre 1993 y 1996 le nombraron presidente de la Facultad de Economía de la Universidad de Bolonia. Es autor de varias publicaciones científicas sobre la teoría microeconómica, sobre la economía política sobre la teoría económica de la producción, sobre los aspectos sociales y éticos de la economía, sobre la historia del pensamiento económico, sobre la economía civil, sobre la economía del bien común, en fin, como ustedes podrán comprobar, sobre un número muy amplio de temas relacionados con la economía. Es miembro del Comité Científico de numerosas revistas académicas en el área de la teoría y de la historia del pensamiento económico. Desde el año 2007 es caballero comendador de la Orden de San Gregorio Magno. Ha sido y es asimismo de, miembro de diversos comités científicos, 
por citar algunos, la Fundación Italiana para el Voluntariado o el Comité Científico de la Semana Social de los Católicos Italianos. Asimismo, desde el año 2010 es doctor honoris causa en Economía por la Universidad Francisco de Vitoria, algo de lo que nos sentimos sumamente orgullosos. El profesor Zamañi es modelo de intelectual y de universitario católico. En esta sede ya se nos ha advertido, ya se nos ha prevenido sobre eh, llamar maestro a los grandes académicos. Sin embargo, creo que es de justicia decir aquí en público que el profesor Zamañe es un verdadero, un auténtico maestro. Por muchas razones, pero yo solo me atrevería, para no alargarme, a señalar dos. La primera, el profesor Zamañe es un hombre de gran inquietud intelectual que se hace preguntas sobre las grandes cuestiones y busca respuestas incansablemente, busca explicaciones. Y además tenemos la suerte de que es un hombre generoso, es un hombre deseoso de compartir su sabiduría con todo aquel que se lo solicita. Por eso, desde la admiración y el agradecimiento, debemos congratularnos profundamente de que esté hoy, esta tarde, aquí con nosotros el profesor Zamañi. Ya se, nos, ya se ha mencionado que nos va a hablar sobre el tema de la relación entre estudio e imperio en la posmodernidad, el papel específico de la Universidad Católica. Y sin más preámbulos, cedo la palabra al profesor Estefano Zamañi. Thank you very, very much. I've been asked to speak in, in English. And uh, as it is my custom, I have to obey, because you see, in particular to the uh, Mrs. Director of the university, and so I practice uh, obedience. Uh, but I think that it's proper. Let me first of all uh, thank you for the invitation to this important congress, the first World Congress of Catholic Universities, and let me also congratulate uh, with um, the organization of the Congress itself uh, for the excellent uh, organization from different points of view. Now, I've been asked, uh, as I said, to talk, and I also appreciated very much the general theme of this Congress, namely identity and mission of a Catholic uh, university today. And I will start exactly with the point, uh, a word of clarification about uh, the concept of identity. As we know, identity has uh, two meanings or interpretation. We can interpret identity as uh, something uh, received uh, from the past, as a sort of inheritance from the past. Uh, but there is a second meaning of identity, as uh, something which is chosen, freely chosen, and uh, which is uh, constantly updating. I use uh, in my uh, argument today identity in the second uh, meaning. And I think that it's important to stress this point because uh, many institutions, academic institutions, Catholic or non-Catholic, have interpreted their identity in the first sense. And that has uh, generated uh, two uh, negative consequences. One is uh, conservatorism. Conservatorism in the sense, literal sense, of keeping uh, a knowledge which has been uh, transmitted from the past. And that, uh, as you know, it's very bad. The other negative consequence of the first interpretation of the concept of identity has to do with the phenomenon of groupthink. Groupthink, in Italian is pensiero di gruppo, in the sense attributed to this expression by the American political theorist Yanis in a, in a famous essay published in 1972 where he explained the difference between groupthink and conformism. Conformism is different from groupthink. And why groupthink is dangerous? Because it prevents creativity, originality. When groupthink becomes dominant in an institution such as the university is the end. 
because that university is incapable of generating uh, new thought and in particular, incapable of reading uh, the rest nove, the new things uh, of the period, historical period we have. So that is why it's proper to stress uh, uh, again, it's not enough to talk about identity per se. It's important to specify which concept of identity we decide uh, to subscribe to, etc. Now, having said so, what, the, in my opinion, which are the basic and fundamental elements making up the identity of a Catholic university today? Today, I mean in the historical period which uh, we happen to live in. In other words, uh, how would I define the genome, the genome of a Catholic university? I think that uh, three basic elements are fundamental. One is uh, generativity. The second one is reciprocity. And the third one is gift, uh, as the principle of gift uh, as gratuitousness. Now, generativity means uh, the uh, perspective towards uh, the generation of new knowledge is the search of truth. If a university doesn't search for truth, it's no longer a university. It can be many other uh, important institutions, but not uh, the character of university. The second element is reciprocity. Reciprocity between uh, students and professors. In the past, Universities were called, uh, in Latin, communitas docentium et uh, studentium, in the community of students and, uh, let's say, professors, teachers. Now, as we know, any community presupposes uh, the principle of reciprocity. It's impossible to keep for a long time the spirit of a community without reciprocity. Be careful, reciprocity is not to be confused uh, with uh, a similar principle, namely the principle of exchange. Exchange is nothing to do with reciprocity. The point is that it's our fault of us as economists that in the last uh, few decades uh, have, uh, we have uh, diffused an idea according to which more or less, reciprocity and exchange of equivalents are the same things. Disaster, disaster, disaster. And now we are observing the effects of that disaster, which is a, a theoretical mistake. So reciprocity, if we want the university to be a community of both students and professors, we need uh, to practice, not only to speak, but to practice the principle of reciprocity. The third one is gift uh, as gratuitousness. As we know, in the literature in particular, both in anthropology and in sociology, there is a huge literature on the principle of gift. But again, people confused. Gift uh, as munus, in Latin munus, uh, is a uh, what you give is the object of gift and gift as a gratuitousness. In other words, the idea of agape. I use the principle of gift in the sense of agape. Now, it seems to me that it is typical of a Catholic university to be able to organize itself in such a way that the three principles, generativity, reciprocity, and gratuitousness are in a sense, molded and uh, jointly applied. And that is uh, what I consider the landmark of the. You can have other universities where they generate a lot of. That is true. That is, there is no need to make names to understand what. They, again, you might find uh, universities where the principle of reciprocity is applied. But what is typical of a Catholic university is to organize itself in such a way as the three principles operates jointly, with no separation. In other words, uh, without assuming the additivity assumption, but the multiplicative assumption, which makes a difference, as we know, between a sum total and the multiplication, etc. Now, having said so then, the question is, why today 
these uh, three elements uh, are identifying the, uh, uh, characterizing the identity of a Catholic university are particularly important. And to answer this question, let me consider briefly a bit of a history of this institution that we call a university. As we know, university was born in the Middle Ages. We should never forget that. And when it was born, it was born on the idea of a distinction separation between studium et imperium. Studium is a study, university. Imperium was the locus of the power. In, the, in those days, we know what the power exactly meant. In, the idea was that imperium deals with the exercise of power. The studium deals with the search for truth. And uh, in the first three or four centuries, until the Renaissance period, the idea of the of university as a studium was the so-called reductium, reductio artium ad theologia. The theology was the, the, in a sense, in this sort of a pyramid, the top of the pyramid. And the idea of university, actually, the word itself, unum vertere, universitas comes from unum vertere, was to direct the different types of knowledge, anthropology, politics, history, in uh, some uh, unific unifying element, which was uh, theology. Now, this more or less, with differences of course, uh, lasted until uh, the beginning of modernity. At the time of modernity, a major change uh, occurred. Namely, the studium, the university, should become a it's a, a, a basic uh, a element indispensable for the imperium. In other words, uh, starting from the 16th centuries onwards, the university becomes uh, not the servant, but uh, functional to the exercise uh, of the power. And uh, in this period, we have two phases. In the first phase, uh, the power was military and uh, political power. The studium was supposed to produce knowledge in one area or another in order to maintain the possibility of a military and political power. There is an episode which I always like to quote in this, uh, in this uh, uh, context which clarifies better than any other discourse the point I'm trying to make. As you know, in uh, 1871, Ernest Renan, the famous French author, Ernest Renan, published a book titled La Reforme Intellectuelle et Morale. La Reforme Intellectuelle et Morale. The Moral and Intellectual Reform. Well, in this book, Renan, who, by the way, was the author of the first story about Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ, he asked himself the following question. How is it the case that uh, uh, um, the Prussia, governed by Bismarck, won against the, the big army of Napoleon III? As we know from history, the French army was much superior in terms uh, of uh, number of soldiers, uh, etc., strategy, etc. But lost. Why is that so? The answer that Renan provided in this book, published in 1871, was the following. Because Bismarck's Prussia, Bismarck was able to put Humboldt University to the service of military power. The Humboldt University, and there is historical evidence, they produced what nowadays call military strategy. And if you know military strategy, you win. Now, if you know, uh, the famous Berlin University was founded at the beginning of the 19th century by Humboldt. And that was pre anticipated by writings by Schelling, important uh, philosopher, German philosophers such as Schelling, Fichte, 
Stephens, and lately Hegel. And in that, the basic idea was the following. The university should serve the nation state. In other words, uh, the reason for existence of a university is to serve the nation state. When Hegel, the famous Hegel, became rector of Humboldt University in uh, 1829, as you know better than me, in particular the philosophers, gave uh, a major impulse uh, to, in this regard. And he strengthened certain studies in order to uh, facilitate uh, the development uh, of the German uh, power, military and political power, etc. Now, that was uh, for the first phase of the modernity. In the second phase, another change occurred. The university is supposed to serve power, but no longer military and political power, but economic power. That is the major role. And uh, what is the place where this change occurred? United States, North America. The Americans have become what we know they have become also because of this fact. They were able to put the university at the service of the market. Of the market. I, be careful, I'm not saying in a banal way, in a very sophisticated way, but the purpose, there is a huge literature proving what I'm saying. And in fact, if you read, if we read John Newman, famous book, The Idea of University, Newman, who was English, and in those days already was able to anticipate what was occurring on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, we can find important pages trying to predict what was going wrong in this direction. But the fact is that uh, since then, universities. Now, this uh, is still today the dominant idea of the university. Now, if you ask me, where can we find uh, the best evidence uh, of this uh, implication? In the Lisbon Declaration a few years ago. The Lisbon Declaration was signed in the year 2007, four years ago. Go and read carefully, but carefully. Not looking at the rhetoric of word, blah, blah, blah. Go to the heart of the What we find in the Lisbon Declaration is the following. Three principles should guide the life of a university. The first one is the strict cooperation, strict cooperation between a university and the enterprise to obtain employability of the students. I quote, eh? employability of the students. In other words, the university has to be structured, organized in all senses in order to increase the degree of employability of students. And so the university has to organize itself, take into consideration the necessity of the business world. Now, the idea is that, uh, which emerged from the Lisbon Declaration, and I am amazed that nobody has stressed that point. The idea is that the student, it's a micro-entrepreneur of himself or herself, which is a novelty. What does it mean, micro-entrepreneur? The following means that the student is a rational human being who buys from the university services, inputs. Services uh, means uh, knowledge, information, uh, uh, whatever. And then this student, as a micro-entrepreneur, little entrepreneur, has to be able to transform this input into output, where output means uh, the capability of getting a job, uh, well paid, or whatever, etc., etc. So now, the implication is that the university should not, I said should not, be a locus of education. It's forbidden. A, a university, it's a locus of instruction and uh, formation. 
and in fact, the word professors, the word professors decline. Professors are instructors. I teach in an American university since 35 years, so I know what I'm saying. We are, when I enter into classroom, I am an instructor, not a professor. You know, the word professor comes from Latin. And you know what does mean, literally speaking, to be a professor. But now we are instructor. We, and we should not educate. Because if I try to educate you as a student, I run the risk of manipulating your mind taking away your freedom of choice. So we should provide the best technique of teaching uh, all the technicalities, uh, uh, using internet, etc., but not pretend to uh, inculcate or transmit a vision of the world. That is forbidden. Some years ago, I did not believe to that. So I tried to make a, a, in corpore vili, as we say in Latin, an experiment. I tried with American students, Johns Hopkins, to follow the education approach. I still remember one student raised the hand and said, you are contradicting the rules of our institution because it's written that you are not supposed to educate. And that is, is a fact. Then, of course, I mean, since uh, I like my freedom, I respect the freedom of others, but I also like my freedom, I tried, I found a way to, <laughs> to well, overtake that. Because uh, you, at the end, you become a bit cunning how to do that. But that is a really effect. You have to tell us that two plus two is equal to four. You have to tell us, I am an economist, uh, the model of supply and demand, blah, 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 all the technicalities. But do not try to talk about, for instance, the ethical dimension. Because ethics has nothing to do with economics. That is the, that is the dogma. Ethics is not. And when I said to my students, uh, or even to my colleagues, I was recently in Chicago, Chicago, business uh, school, eh, Chicago, in the last uh, uh, March, last April, in a, with colleagues of mine, and I said to them, I could speak freely with them because they were colleagues. Do you realize that economics was historically born from a rib of ethics? They said, yes, we know, but th those are old. In those days, we Americans did not exist. And so now this is the new wave, etc., etc. So that is uh, the first implication of the Lisbon uh, uh, Declaration of four years. The second implication is even from a certain point of view more troublesome. Namely, research is transformed into contest, into contest. And that is a very serious business. It's a, in una gara, in Italian we would say contest, in una gara. In other words, uh, the idea is that only the first, the first who discovers or invent something new should be rewarded. Reward means obtains uh, finance, financing the project. The other ones, forget. In other words, uh, the rule of priority, the rule of priority is meritocracy. Full stop. In other words, uh, research is uh, supposed to produce uh, something original or new in order to be functional to the various areas of application. And on the basis of that, you get the funds. And as we know, this practice today is applied even in the European Union. I don't know if you have experience, since I have a lot of experience in that, you can present the best project you will never get financed unless you demonstrate that the results of your project of research can be utilized in biology, in uh, chemistry, in economics, uh, etc., in management, etc. Because otherwise it's irrelevant. By the way, that is the reason why humanities are in deep crisis nowadays. Nowadays, philosophy and other. Because since they cannot uh, 
generates that, they, very little money goes to them. As we know, there are statistics uh, proving that, etc. Unless you find uh, a very good philanthropist who tries to help you. But these are exception, is not the rule. The third implication of the Lisbon Declaration is that the scientific process, which by itself has uh, the nature of a cooperative game, has become a competitive game. If you think, uh, and there is no need to be historian of science to know that over centuries, the discovery of truth has always been a cooperative game, a team, a kipo, where we put together, we, I try to inform you, you inform me, I, I tell you something, etc. Nowadays, it's no longer. Everybody is jealous of what he or she has produced and will never uh, anticipate until before the publication to the others. Now, this is creating uh, why, that is the question, uh, from a cooperative game, the research uh, game has become a highly competitive game. The name is uh, efficiency. efficiency. In other words, uh, since uh, efficiency nowadays is the new, is the new god, the god of efficiency. Look what happened in this uh, financial crisis. Everything occurred because uh, of the god of efficiency. And so in order to stimulate efficiency, you have to generate a highly competitive game. Technically speaking, we talk about positional competition, not of cooperative competition, but positional competition. And Schelling, an American economist, a Nobel Prize winner, has written very important Thomas Schelling pages on the, uh, on the misfortune of positional competition, etc. So now you see the criteri criterion of rentability is connected to the principle of efficiency. And if efficiency is the, the key word, it is obvious that the university become a sort of a little market where professors, students, they have to compete one with another. And they compete in the sense of positionality. Because if I win, you lose. If I win, you lose. And if you lose, I increase my chances of winning and obtaining the result. Okay? That is, these are facts. Some people, some of my colleagues, they shut their eyes. Because they do not want to see, but these are facts, and facts are indisputable. You can interpret the facts, but the facts are facts, are something objective. Okay? Now, eh, I still remember, I conclude on that, um, what John Paul II said in Rome. It was uh, November 29th of the year 2004. That was the last public speech of John Paul II. After that, as we know, he got trouble, he couldn't speak, and a few months later passed away. Now, in that speech, John Paul II pronounced a speech which, in my opinion, is the most important. And because he is the most important, everybody has forgotten. <laughs> it's always like that. He said, I quote by heart, the discrimination based upon efficiency is not less dishumane than discrimination based on sex, religion, and ethnic, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ethnic races, etc. And he concluded, today, the new form of discrimination among people and among countries is the principle of efficiency. That was his last speech. And uh, if you think uh, he, re he really got the point, he really got the point. Which, by the way, does not mean that efficiency is not important. Of course it's important. What I'm saying is not the only criterion. That is the point. It is obvious that it's important because we have to be efficient. But if in order to be efficient we forget the other elements, of course the conclusion is obvious. So now you, we understand why it is, it today is so important uh, to consider the 
the role of a Catholic university. And in this regard, I can state a thesis which is rather strong, I believe, it is strong. It is in the present situation, Catholic universities, they have the duty to rescue the idea of university itself. In other words, in this situation, Catholic university, because of their identity and because of their history, are in a position to be able to modify at least partly this uh, situation. Because if we go on in this direction I described a few minutes ago, there is no future for the We will transform university into a research center, which is okay. There are many research centers all over the world. We will transform them into specialized institutes for advanced studies, okay, but that will no longer be university in the proper sense of the word. So that is why I believe so much nowadays in the mission of the university, of the Catholic university, because it is on the shoulder of a Catholic university to uh, perform such a fundamental task. And so now, coming to my last part of my presentation, because you see I have to keep uh, the watch in front of me, uh, is the following. What should Catholic University do in order to pursue this target, which is a fundamental target? I limit myself, for lack of time, to two. Uh, the first one has to do with the, uh, the idea of autonomy. Autonomy. You know, the... Con the Notion of autonomy, it's a long, uh, since a long time, we keep on talking about autonomy. In other words, what we have to be able to solve nowadays is the new concept of autonomy, which means, uh, if you allow me to be prosaic, to solve the problem of money, of finance. Because unless a Catholic university, a Catholic university it's uh, independent from the budget constraint, it will never be autonomous. That is a, a theorem. It's useless to discuss. In other words, if we want to keep our autonomy, we need to be free from the budget. Because if in order to keep up our activities, we need to knock the doors like beggars asking for money, that is the end. Because those... Ill all over the world, there are many people who are rich enough to be prepared to finance. But the very moment that they give money, they buy. They buy our soul, the soul of a Catholic university. And that is the end. What's the point then? What's the point? Because if the only issue is to generate knowledge, there are many other institutions who can do that, etc. So now the real question is how to cope with this problem. Of course, now I have no time to enter into details, and I have no time. As you know, I am presently president of the Italian, the Italian authority for the third sector. Third sector means non-profit organization. There is an authority like uh, the Charity Commission in England. In, in America, they have uh, other uh, names, but the concept is the authority which looks uh, in, in Spain, there is no probably, I don't know why, but I do not yet have it. And, uh, and so I know quite from the internal point of view the situation of the non-profit organization and in particular of civil society. My idea is that uh, Catholic University, they have to establish uh, an alliance with uh, civil society, but organized civil society or organizations of civil societies in, in different areas. Because uh, if Catholic University, in order to finance uh, its activity, has to ask money to the government, to the state, that is the end. That is the end. Because even state money, it uh, follows the same logic, that the one who, who pays, buys, as we say in economics, the one who pays always buy. 
when you pay for a, a pair of shoes, you buy those shoes, which means you buy what you like. He is the same. That is a general rule. And at the other hand, uh, we cannot uh, uh, is expect uh, an individual arrest to be financed by only one or few philanthropists for the same reason. So we have to invent, uh, and for doing that, we had better go and read uh, what people uh, belonging uh, to the first period of the life university had written. Because uh, historically, we have seen last night in the that marvelous performance, the, the starting from Bologna and then um, at Salamanca and then Paris, etc. Et if you go and read the, the documents of the time, all those universities were financed by civil society, not by the prince, not by the political, but because they knew. Since they wanted to be independent and autonomous, they said we should not get the money from only one source or few sources. We have to get money from civil society, from people, from people organized in a particular way. Now, this is, in my opinion, the first challenge looking into the future. Because the day we become, financially speaking, independent, we are really free to produce what we believe or in the way we consider most appropriate, etc. The second challenge, the second proposal has to do with the issue of what is called nowadays a new paideia. The new paideia. Paideia is a Greek word which means uh, the new model of education. Now, Jungmann, the famous, uh, well-known uh, Jungmann uh, pedagogist, in a book a few years ago, said that, gave uh, this important definition of education when he says education is the introduction of the person, in particular young person, to total, total reality. Is the introduction to I educate a young fellow when I help him to get into totality, the totality of reality. And the question is, which elements of reality students uh, should be introduced to? As we know, the elements are basically four. One is values or principles. The second is ends, choosing among ends. The third is means, choosing among the best mean to get the target. And the fourth is are norms. Now, it is a fact eh, that our university nowadays, they only speak about means and norms. They, for the reason I mentioned before, they do not speak about values. It's forbidden to speak about values. You know, the argument of uh, uh, multiculturalism, etc. Et that is only one example. And uh, also about ends. Because the idea is the ends is the province of individual liberty. Each one of us has to choose its end. So you cannot tell me what should be my ends. So the university has the duty of helping me to choose among the means. What is the best mean to achieve that target? Or about norms. Could be social norms or even better legal norms. So we have to teach uh, principle of legality, etc. Now, it is obvious that uh, means uh, and norms are important, but they are not enough. A, an educational project presupposes the four elements. So, the new paideia uh, of a Catholic university is exactly my opinion that. And a Catholic university should uh, propose, never impose, never but propose to the students a project where the four elements are, are joined. And uh, to make the point even clearer, let me use uh, an example which is very well known to all the economists and which I use with my students. The paradigm of rationality. If you do not believe me, ask uh, any economist in all the universities to talk about rationality, and you ask him or her, 
What is the paradigm of rationality that uh, you are following? The answer is we follow Ulysses paradigm. Because as you know, Ulysses, from Greek mythology, was supposed to be very, very cunning, listo, very rational. And the story is the story of Ulysses and the Syrians. Ulysses wanted, the end was to listen the, the song of the Syrians. But as you know, the Syrians were dangerous. So, La Circe taught to Ulysses the following. If you want to listen without falling into the sea and dying, you should uh, put um, earplugs to your um, men. And you should ask them to be with strong bonds, uh, shackles, like to the mast of the ship. And uh, since even though you ask them to get free of the bonds, uh, they will not listen because uh, they uh, have earplugs. Now, Ulysses is rational. Of course it's rational, because he, he was able to reach his target, listening to the Syrians, without jeopardizing his life. But, and people are content about that. Jon Elster, a Norwegian philosopher, sociologist, has written a book, a book as big as that, whose title is Ulysses and the Syrians. That, I found that uh, scandalous because nobody tells the students what is the price that Ulysses paid for being rational. What was the price? Two. One, he lost liberty. For a few hours, he was to the mast, so he was not free. But second, injustice. Because Ulysses was capable of listening the song, but the poor Roman, they were prevented. So that is unfair. Do we want to be rational? And uh, in the way of Ulysses and being, uh, losing freedom and losing justice? No, I do not like that. And so what do I prefer? I prefer another paradigm of rationality, which is the paradigm of Orpheus. You know the story of Orpheus. When Jason, with the Argonauts, started uh, to look for the golden fleece, eh? il vello d'oro in Italian, Vello d'oro. He was looking for the golden fleece. He decided to embark Orpheus. Orpheus, <laughs> he was a, a man, idol good for nothing, because he was only good in playing the lira. But he played very well. And, Orf and Jason was able to convince his friends to embark Orpheus. What happened? That when the boat of the Argonauts passed by the island of the Syrians, Orpheus started playing the lyra. And the music of Orpheus, Michel, uh, blending itself with the song of the Syrians, and nullified the perverse effect. And so everybody was able to listen the song of the Syrians, beautiful song, without losing freedom, without uh, 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 committing an injustice. Now, what is uh, the moral of this story? That why Orpheus succeeded? Because Orpheus and Jason, they applied the principle of reciprocity. Because Orpheus offered as a gift uh, to the Syrians the, 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 the music, and the Syrians reciprocated. And this reciprocation nullified the perverse effect, which was the consequence of the fact that the Syrians misbehaved and the gods in order to penalize them. Now, what do, when I ask to my students, what do you prefer? What do you consider superior as a paradigm of rationality? Do you consider superior the rationality of Ulysses or the rationality of Orpheus? All of them, they say, or fails. And so why you behave according to the paradigm of uh, Ulysses? And the answer they give is because you professor, professor of economics, you keep on writing in your books uh, that the only way to be rational is the way of Ulysses. That, that is true. So that is an, a, a, a tiny, tiny example of what I mean proposing uh, 
an educational project. Now I have finished my time and so I have to conclude, unfortunately, but I know you are fed up and so I had better conclude. And uh, what I am saying is that the gist of an of a educational project is that uh, today we live in a period where the, uni the vertere ad unum, the unity of knowledge, cannot be operated at the level of the object. It's impossible. That was possible in the Middle Ages. But what we can do, and we, and sometimes we succeed, is trying to operate the unity of knowledge at the level of the subject of knowledge, not at the level of object. And the subject is a human being, it's a human person. That is why the educational process proposal is so important. And to conclude, uh, let me conclude with this. As you know, in the, towards the end of Caritas Veritate, our Pope Benedict XVI writes uh, something like that. Uh, humanity, or the, the world today, suffers because of a scarcity of thought. He didn't write, suffers because of a scarcity of resources, because it's not true. It's not the lack of resources which uh, make problematic our life, but lack of thought. But as we know, there are two types of thought. Calculating thought and thinking thought. What happened, calculating thought is the thought of Ulysses. In other words, uh, in the last uh, decades, uh, we have developed uh, too much attention to calculating thought and not to thinking thought. Thinking thought is the thought which gives us the, the line, the, the, the way to. We need uh, to balance that. And to do that, uh, perhaps uh, an important, because I pay duty to my origin, I, was, uh, I graduated in the university, Catholic University in Milan, Ambrosius. Ambrosius, who was uh, Saint Ambrosius, the, the bishop of, of Milan, said uh, in an important page, uh, authentic culture is always uh, the result of two movements, what he called uh, semper, a nova semper querere, parta custodire which in Latin means uh, the first moment, trying to always uh, look for new things. But the second element, keep uh, what you have inherited uh, from the tradition, from the past, which is the idea of trying to put together the wings uh, and the roots. The roots uh, have to do with the parta custodire, what we have inherited from our predecessors, but we should not stop there. We have also to put into function the wings, because the wings uh, without uh, roots uh, generates sometimes trouble, as we know, but also the opposite is true. Uh, roots without wings uh, degenerates into conservatory. So perhaps uh, this is uh, ultimately what I would uh, consider the strategic and fundamental role of a Catholic universities in the present day world. Thank you very much. I said the five, eh? Muchísimas gracias, profesor Zamani, por esta extraordinaria conferencia. También muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes eh, que están aquí reunidos en este congreso. Para poder cumplir con el calendario y poder cumplir con, con los tiempos, pues nos vemos obligados a poner punto final, puesto que a continuación viene la, la mesa de expertos. Muchísimas gracias.